Please. Thank you. What an honor it is to be here. Uh, first of all, just thank you everyone for inviting me here. Jeanette, thank you for it. When you have someone that amazing and powerful introduce you, it puts a lot of pressure on you. I'd sit here and listen to her all day. Uh, so I'm honored to be here. Mart, thank you for everything that you've done. Josh, you know, thank you for inviting me and recommending me. Um, Josh recommended me. He saw me in Indianapolis several years or last year speak at uh, insurance group. So, but also know that Josh has stick together. Um, <laughs> if I'd like to thank the other speaker Josh recommended. Josh, thanks for being here. Um, but no, it's wonderful to be here. I grew up in Indiana. I was a small, you know, farm kid. Had wonderful, wonderful parents. My dad was a high school school teacher for 36 years in Indianapolis. My mom worked for the Red Cross. For our, she was the director of in our local town. So at an early age, what I saw was two family members just working hard but giving back, being part of the community. I saw things go wrong at my dad's school. Kids, you know, have troubles, but my dad always stepped in. My mom, obviously working at the Red Cross, I saw things happen in our community where people had fires, where people didn't have enough food. But what I saw is obviously people step in, the community step back, donate toys for Christmas and things like that. And I just saw a beautiful thing growing up where, you know, it's ebb and flow. But being around you guys, an insurance agency, what I see is another thing, because one thing is you guys know your community. Whether you are the small businesses, the two or three, or the big businesses, these are meaningful things that you do. Insurance is one of those things that it's a safety net. It's something you don't have to want to deal with ever. You don't want the worst to happen, but you prepare for it. And you guys know your members. You know your community. You're a big part of it. But you also know each other, and it's a family in here. That's how I was raised, just give and do your best. I grew up a typical Indiana kid. I played basketball all through high school. I got bigger. As you heard, I went to Purdue University, and I actually played lacrosse at Purdue all four years there. Out of the four and a half, five, five and a half years, I was actually there. <laughs> It took me a while to get out of school, I'm not going to lie. I enjoyed it very, very much. Um, but I finally got out, and I got a real job. And I got a real job at an insurance company. At 22 years old, I became a corporate recruiter for Conseco Insurance in Carmel, Indiana. I recruited for IT. I recruited VPs to come there. It was one of those things I didn't know anything about insurance. I'm going to tell you right now, I, I still don't know anything about insurance. That's not why I'm here to talk to you about anything logistics at all. But I loved it because I was 22 years old and had a great opportunity. At 22, I had an opportunity to go out and do my best. At 22, I had a fire in my belly that I wanted to change. Not the industry or anything, but I wanted to change what I could. I wanted to be great for the people I hired. I wanted to be a perfect fit. I wanted to work great for my managers, for my superiors, for the people that worked for me. I wanted to do everything I could every single day because it would better somebody. It would better my life as well and grow my career. But that's what I wanted. About two months after I started working at Conseco Insurance, the company filed bankruptcy. And I knew right then that life isn't always greatness. It always is that sometimes there's outside factors you can't control. No matter the burning thing I had in my belly to do my best to go out there and be efficient, to hire good people. My job now, I still had to go in every single day to a company that large that had never come out of bankruptcy. And I had to ask people to come work there. It's not a great marketing advice. I'm not going to lie. It wasn't wonderful to do. But I said, you know what? I'm going to be honest. I'm going to say what we're going through. I'm going to offer opportunities. I'm not going to ever change that. I'm going to be a man of my word. I'm going to give them the opportunities to grow with us here, to see what happens. And we're very fortunate, luckily, that they came out of bankruptcy and still around today. Now, I'm a very calm and wonderful, easygoing person, I feel like. The only time I ever, ever get upset, usually, is like most of us, it's in traffic. <laughs> and I know here in Texas, you guys deal with traffic. But I'm not the person, I don't honk, I don't make any gestures, I don't do anything like that, I don't yell or anything like that. It just is all internal. It's the sweating in the car, just mumbling underneath my breath. It's all me, and I hate it, but that's where I get my frustration out. And I remember I was stuck in traffic a long time ago, driving to my corporate job at Kinseco. I got stuck in traffic, and the same thoughts, and come on, I'm going to be late, and I have stuff to do, ran through my head. And my phone rang. And it was a good friend of mine. She said, hey, are you listening to the radio? I said, no, I'm stuck as always. She said, turn it on. So I turned on the radio and started listening to the events of 9-11 take place. 
as most of us remember that day, I got to work, we found a television, we turned it on and watched that horrific day unfold. And listen to Jeanette talk about going to the memorial, uh, those images start coming back. Those feelings start coming back to me of what we were going through. I knew that our country was changing. I had family at the time, a sister in Japan, we were trying to get her home because we didn't know what was happening in the world. I had a sister in Washington, D.C., we were trying to get home. But then you start thinking about your community, the people at my own company that had family members out there. I went home that night, I gathered with our community, I gathered in homes, we prayed, we talked. But something inside of me was stirring. That voice that always told me to work hard, had been raised to do the right things, was telling me there was something that I could do. That I was a big kid physically, I'd played sports my whole life. That I believed in serving in the military. My father was an F-4 fighter pilot in the Marine Corps from 68 to 73. My grandfather was a wonderful man. He was from Kentucky, he was Irish. He had a voice and an accent that was undeniable who he was. He served in the Army in World War II. And I, growing up with my grandfather, he had always talked about it a little bit more with me than the other grandchildren. He knew I was fascinated with it, but he always told me, and he had a cut on his arm, pretty bad scar. And I'd ask him one day, and from what I remember, it was a bullet wound he had taken on the battlefield in northern Africa. And that's really all I knew, that he had lived his life. He went on to work at Ford Motor Company, uh, retired from there, and had a great, wonderful life. Two years ago, I was going down to New Orleans to speak at the World War II Museum. And I said, you know what? I'm going to speak about my grandfather because he was in World War II. This is what this museum is dedicated to, this generation that did all this. And I knew most of the things about my grandfather I thought I did. And I started researching him. I wanted to write, you know, make sure I had the right cavalry number, the infantry unit. I knew his rank of captain. So I started looking up a little bit on the Internet and Googling my grandfather, and I just came across a website from the Indiana government that had his name on it, and I clicked on it. And there was an audio link on that website, and it was an audio link of my grandfather 20-some years ago telling his story for 40 minutes. Like I said, he's from Kentucky, has a thick, thick accent. I knew right away that this was him, and he was telling me for 40 minutes they were recording these World War II generation stories. I never knew he had recorded it. And I started listening to the trials of him growing up in a small town, and the military was a way out. But also with his love of the country and what he wanted to do. And for 40 minutes, I listened to my grandfather talk about his time over there. And what I realized is that it wasn't a bullet wound he had suffered. He was tasked in northern Africa in the taking of Hill 609. It was a strategic point at that time in the battle, and we were fighting for it. And his captain, his officer, excuse me, his CO, commanded his unit to start up that hill. But before they left, his commanding officer told him, hey, once you get over that hill, they have that dialed in. The enemy knows that location. They're going to send mortars. They're going to send gunfire. And they're going to just hit it as hard as possible to stop you. He said, you have to tell your men that we will lose people today, but you just keep going. And I listened to my grandfather tell us and having to relay that some awful information about what they're going to face. And he's telling his men, and he said, we start up that hill, and we get on the backside, and that's when the mortars start coming and the gunfire. He goes, we run down it, and he goes, I lost men, and you keep going. He said, then you get to the next peak and have to run up and do the same thing over and over again. Once he's starting on his way back up, a mortar went off near him. And the shrapnel from the mortar, it went into his arm, almost severed his arm, and he went down. At that point, they're in a battle. In World War II, they didn't have all the medical procedures. They didn't have backup like we do now, helicopters to come get. He had a choice. He said, I was able to either lay down there, give up and die, or I stood up and continued back and tried to find help. He chose the latter, thankfully for me and my generations. He stood up and started walking to the rear. He walked and walked. He said he found a dry riverbed and walked in that until he couldn't walk anymore. And eventually he said he said, fell to his injuries and passed out. And he said one of his own men came to his rescue, picked him up, and carried him to safety. He said when he awoke from his injuries, he could hear amazing grace being played on the bagpipes. He said, I knew I'd made it to heaven. He said, then I heard my sergeant's voice. That man had not made it to heaven. 
those are the stories that I grew up with, but I realized that we all have those people in our lives, those sergeants, that that voice goes straight to us. That those people that were like, you know what, heaven is not including you by any means. But I'm thankful for that person. I'm thankful for those people in my life that have always pushed me harder and harder, that are on my heels at all times. We know those people in the industry that sometimes push us to be greater, push us to be better. We're thankful for that, trust me, because it makes us tougher. After listening to my grandfather's stories, I said it was my time. It was my time to serve this country. So I walked into the recruiting station. I took the oath. I signed the paperwork. And I decided to follow in my father's footsteps and become a United States Marine. In 2004, at the age of 27, they sent me to boot camp. And you quickly realize that 27 is not young to go to boot camp. I was the oldest recruit at the time in the Marine Corps recruit depot out in San Diego. And these guys let me know. These 17 and 18-year-olds definitely let me know that I was old. They called me Grandpa from day one at 27 years old. It was very hurtful. I'm not going to lie. But these 17 and 18-year-olds, I was 10 years older than some of them. They were a different generation. I thought, we'll never connect. I know more. Some of them, the first time they had ever been on a plane was to fly out to boot camp. Had never left their own hometowns before. But what I realized is that they were there for the same dedication, the same reason. They were willing to give up their lives to make this country great. They are willing to fight with us, and I had to respect that. But you realize that all our whole lives, we have been surrounded by different generations. At work and family and everything, what you do is you figure it out. You figure out the good times and the bad, that we are different. And the Marines are known for the brutality, for the hardships of boot camp and how difficult it is. And for 13 weeks, day in and day out, it is. But you learn to do it together. You learn that you can do anything. And people ask me and they say something like, I don't think I could have done it. You could. Anybody could do it because they push you harder and harder. And we have drill instructors. These guys are mean. They're animals. But I tell you what, they're preparing you for what you're about to face. And Josh had talked about being the best. When you're the best in this industry, be the best. Put the work in. Put the effort. And that's what the Marine Corps teaches us, that you have to be the best. They say, if you want to be a Marine, you're going to be the best. Not, hey, go do your best. They're like, be the best. That's what we expect out of you. And I tell you what, it pushed us to do that. And for 13 weeks, I pushed myself, and I finally became a United States Marine. And I remember that day. It was one of the proudest moments in my life. My parents had flown out to see me graduate from boot camp, and I was excited. I hadn't seen them or talked to them in 13 weeks. And I remember standing there as they called us Marines for the first time. They had called us recruits for 13 weeks. But we earned that title. And we take a step back and the family start pouring out of the bleachers. They're trying to get to their newly minted Marines, their loved ones they haven't seen, and get a hold of them and talk to them and just love on them. And I remember watching my mom and my dad come out of those bleachers. I remember thinking I had a big lump in my throat. I was starting to get shaky, but I was like, I'm a big, tough Marine now. I can't let these emotions get to me. And my mom get closer and closer to me. I just couldn't wait to see him and talk to him. I was so excited. And finally, my mom was almost to me and she walked right past me. Because we all look exactly the same at boot camp. <laughs> we do. We all have the same haircut. We have the same uniform. The little guys get bigger somehow. The big guys get little. It's ridiculous. We look exactly alike. So these parents are looking for someone that I haven't seen in 13 weeks that looks like 100 other guys. But I got a hold of my mom. I said, Mom, and she came back and, you know, just celebrated with me. But it was at that moment I realized until years later that someone told me the story that I hadn't told my parents what I was doing in the Marine Corps. I hadn't told them. I said I joined the Marines, and they were very proud. My dad had been a Marine. But until that day, I graduated, and I told them I joined the infantry. I wanted to be a front line. I wanted to go. And that was hard for them to accept, but they are very thankful. They are very supportive. So I did nine more weeks of infantry rifleman school. I learned a lot more about tactics of war, a lot more about weapon systems, what you have to do. And then I came back to Indiana. I was a reservist for a while. So I actually went back to my job at Conseco at the insurance business. I ran the call center for two years. Until January of 2006, I received a phone call from my sergeant. The phone rang. I answered it. I excused myself from my friends. He said, Blau, we got the call. We've been activated. We're headed over. And he knew what that meant to me. He knew the understanding that I had with that. He knew I was excited the reason I had joined, but he also was a smart man. He said, Blau, before you have any excitement, know that your family, your friends will have hard times with this. They'll have emotions too. Deal with it. He said, give them the time, the conversations. So that's what we did. I had the hard talks. We had the tears, but my family raised me to have fun, to enjoy life. And then I got back to work. 
have to prepare just like you guys come and re-educate, go over seminars. You continue, as you know, the market keeps changing. Regulations, technology, how you read clients. COVID changed a lot of different things, how you do things. It's the same in any industry. It's the same in the Marine Corps. We prepare. We want to be ready for the worst. We hope for the best. Just like insurance, you want the best. You don't want half the people to come in with you. You want them to be protected at all times, but you don't want them to get that call as something went wrong. And they're, yes, obviously, thank you. They have you and have their policies. Who would much rather not deal with that? Same in the Marines. We train. We go out to California. We train in mock cities. Train what we're about to do, but we train if someone gets hurt, someone's killed, because we want to be ready. We want to be protected. That's our insurance. What a lot of people don't know is that we know even in every industry, even in a war, it's about people, it's about relationships, it's about who you know, communities. So we train with 150 Iraqi citizens. Some of us learn the language, we learn their culture, how to be respectful. Because we know you get a lot farther in life with having common goals, with helping people, helping communities, than you do just trying to strong arm somebody, by just trying to go in there as Marines and take over. And in September of 2006, my unit got sent to the city of Fallujah, Iraq. I knew what that meant. There were 200 of us that lived in that city. We were doing what Marines do. We are going after the bad guys. We are going house to house. But at that time, it was Fallujah, Ramadi, and Baghdad was considered the triangle of death because of how many people we were losing over there. But we were there to better the place, help give those guys a fighting chance. And basically, every night we would go out looking for these guys, individuals, going on different missions. But that very first night was the most nerve-wracking. We had just gotten to Fallujah. We had got all our stuff, our, our gear. I was in charge of three young men. I was a fire team leader. And that night, our mission was to hit a house looking for a target we had intel on. I remember that night well because we were walking down the streets at 3, 4 in the morning. And that night, I had taken point, so I'm walking out front. And I'm not on top of my other guys. They're not near me because we walk farther apart just out of protocol. Because if I take enemy fire, if I trip a mine, I don't want them getting hit. And they do the exact same thing for me. I remember that very first night, it was three in the morning. We're out getting ready to hit a house. I had two other fire teams hitting two other houses. So I stopped at the corner of a building just to check my timetables, check my route, make sure we were good to go. I remember I, I turned around to give my signal to my gunner, Tim Lang, big old 21-year-old, tough as nail, one of 12 brothers and sisters. I relied on him for everything. I told him to stop 15 yards behind me so he knew that I was checking so he'd get security. As I gave him that signal to stop, I turned around and he was standing on top of me. He was right behind me and I turned to him and he's just, all I can see, it's three in the morning, the whites of his eyes. And I'm half irritated why he's standing there. He knows he's not supposed to be near me. And he kind of looks back and forth both ways as he's carrying his big saw gun. And he looks at me and says, man, this is scary out here, right? <laughs> I was like, absolutely it is, man. I'm like, I'm glad you feel that way. And that's just all he needed to say to me. And I was like, yeah. And he went back on to what he was doing and secured the area. And what that made me realize is that we are tough as nail. We train for this stuff over and months and years to do this. You know, we're considered the best of the best, but it doesn't take away the fear, the, the anxiety, any of that. And that's why we do it. That's why we lean on each other. It's the same in this business. If you're starting a business or you've been in it for 40 years, you still get those times of just anxiety. There's other stress going on. There's families and stuff like that. There's outside forces besides insurance. But don't ever think for a second you're alone. The IIT and these organizations look around you. You have family here that you can lean on. Those brothers over there were the guys I leaned on. And trust me, I wouldn't be here mentally or physically without them. It's groups like this. It's you guys that do it together that come here and celebrate. But get to see each other again. But to get to laugh. Don't lose those things because when it comes to this industry, it's good to run things, figure out things together, how it's evolving. October 15th of 2006 was my day. We were out on patrol that day. We were in Humvees chasing down targets. So we were stopping vehicles, surrounding them, pulling them out, arresting them. We turned them over to the Iraqi army, then we do it over and over again. After a particular stop, I loaded back up. My eyes climbed back in. I was in the back. We got who we needed to get, we took off driving down the road and did a quick U-turn over the median. When we turned over the median, that's when the bomb was set off. My world went black. I was instantly knocked out. That explosion went off underneath my side of the vehicle, ripped through the bottom. 
And my big sappy plate, my bulletproof vest that protected me came out and broke my jaw and I was done. Those other young men and the other two Humvees, they circled back around and once 17 and 18 year olds that I doubted, now 20 years old, pulled me out of the wreckage, tourniqueted my legs and got me to Camp Fallujah, a nearby surgical hospital. I owe my life to those young men. I woke up five days later in Launchville, Germany. No recollection of what happened. Last I remember I was tough. I was a Marine fighting for justice in Iraq and now I laid in a hospital bed. My jaw had been wired shut. I had a trach in my neck to breathe. And they explained the hardest of everything. I lost two of my Marines. My sergeant had been killed directly in front of me and my roommate, one of my closest friends, was killed next to me. My gunner, big tough 21-year-old Tim Lang, was thrown from the wreckage. He lost his right leg, but he's doing well to this day. My driver, who was literally diagonally from me, wasn't touched. He had a single scratch. He walked out. He finished his tour. Obviously, he dealt with a lot of mental stuff, but he's doing good to this day, Winnie. There are five people in that vehicle and very different outcomes. And sometimes in life, we may think we're in the same situation as somebody else, and it just turns out different. It's the same in this industry. It's the same as in your companies. You may be doing the exact same thing and running the exact same situation, but it just turns out differently. That's just how life is, how timing works, how the things, but it's okay to deal with it, to go forward, to find the motivation to keep going. I knew that I'd been blessed just to even survive that. They explained to me the extent of my injuries. I lost both of my legs above the knee. I have 27 pins in my hip. A six inch screw in my pelvis. I broke my nose, my jaw, both my wrists. They classify me with post traumatic stress disorder and severe traumatic brain injury. My father will tell you, yeah, my brain was like this before. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> it's always been way off. I'm not gonna lie about that. I was hurt, I was scared, I was devastated, I was angry. My faith was tested, but I got sent back here to the United States. And I tell you what, it was amazing to be from this country. Because all over this country we've been supported, we were sent, and I was sent to Walter Reed Medical Hospital, a place to learn to get my body back in shape. But I realized that I was different, that there are new things going on. My life was absolutely new again. I didn't know how I was going to do it. Sometimes we face those things, we face those challenges in life that say, I don't know. I don't know how I'm ever going to get through this year. I don't know how we're going to deal with COVID and get through this. I don't know with this new technology or where we're at with recessions or where we're at with this. How am I going to deal with this? It's just because it's new. It's scary. It's anxious. You do with it by the support around you. This room is filled with people that are willing to be there, that have gone through decades and decades of experience. And I was surrounded by wonderful doctors and surgeons and therapists, but I was also surrounded with men and women going through the same situation. They'd lost limbs. They'd lost friends. It was the most motivating place I'd ever been because we knew we were blessed. We'd been given time. So we worked our butts off. I got my ba body back in shape. I started pushing it. I got stronger and stronger. And I remember that first day came when I got new prosthetic legs. I'd been in a wheelchair for six months and finally the day came. I got to stand again. And I was so excited. I missed it. And I was ready to start my adventure, to learn to get my life back. And I remember they brought out the two prosthetic legs. And I remember looking at the legs and I was like, hmm because they were the two shortest prosthetic legs you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> and I was like, look at my arms. I was much taller than this. You know I was. That's unproportional all the way around. They're like, no, this is where you start. You start with these little tiny legs, and I, you wouldn't be able to see me behind this platform. I'm not going to lie. And they start, and your feet are turned around backwards. And I was like, now I know that's not right. Like, that's not right. I know that. And they're like, no, you get your balance first. You have to learn to stand before you can go. And I said, all right. And it was humbling. But sometimes when you're starting off and you know with anything new, you have to get your feet underneath you before you can just take off running. And the three things they always taught me about learning to walk is always keep your head up. Have a strong core. Just take one step at a time. It's the same in life. This core, that strong core that you have to have in there is physical, but it's also all the things we believe our ethics, our faith, our family, the things that are important to us. You have a strong core. You don't bend on those things. Always keep your head up. You know, we have four kids. And I tell you what, they all play sports. And they all have their greatness and their weaknesses. And sometimes they have good games and bad games. But the one thing we always tell them, if we see that head drop, it's the first thing we say, get your head up. It's not over because of that. Get your head up. Look forward. Take one step at a time. We'll get better. We'll work with you. It's the same in life. Keep your head up. People notice that. People notice attitudes. And I tell you what, when I was Walter Reed recovering, I noticed the things. 
I spent about two years at Walter Reed recovering, getting my life back. Learned to get back all the things that I'd lost, I thought. During those times, I had great adventures. I had hard trials. I had surgery after surgery. I had setbacks, but I had good days and bad days. But it never stopped going forward. I never stopped wanting to get better. Because I knew this was my life. I knew that things weren't going to be done just because I felt sorry for myself. The world was going to keep spinning. Yeah, there was great support, great letters, great morale. And I tell you what, I live in a beautiful country that gave to us and gave us opportunities. And one of those opportunities I got, I actually got to go see the Indianapolis Colts play the Chicago Bears in the Super Bowl in the 2006-2007 season. It was in Miami. They took 10 of us injured Marines down there, watched the Super Bowl. And I'm from Indy. That was my team. I apologize. I know where I am in this country, all right? And they won, and it was awesome. We got a police escort, a private plane to that thing. And when we were done, I remember it took us back to what I thought was going to be like a four- or five-star hotel. They took us back to a Marine Corps barracks. <laughs> and they slept on cots with horse blankets, like those old ones that no one had used probably in 30 years. We went right back to being Marines, and we were kind of giggling stuff. But throughout the night, I tell you this because the cots were old, and they would break throughout the night, and you'd hear, and it would just hit the ground. But then you'd hear someone say, hey, you hand me my leg? <laughs> and it happened over and over. It was awesome. <laughs> like, if anybody would have walked in there, it looked awful. There were arms and legs everywhere. <laughs> but we sat there crying with tears running down our face, giggling to each other like school kids because it was awesome. Because we realized, you know what, this, this could be an awful situation, but it's your mentality, it's how you look at life, it's how you embrace those things, and it's who you surround yourself by. Look around this room and the laughs that you've had and the fun and the golf and the drinks and everything. It's who you surround yourself by, and it doesn't have to end when you leave here. IAT takes care of you, they watch over you, they bring you back together, but it's also you have people's numbers, contact information. This is family. Rely on one another. After winning that Super Bowl and coming back, I got to meet the owner of the Colts, Mr. Jim Mercer, when they were out at Walter Reed visiting. And they offered me a position with the Colts when I got back home to Indy. So after two years, I went home to Indianapolis and I started working for the Indianapolis Colts as the Colts community spokesperson. And one of my biggest fears going into that job was I didn't want to be seen, that I looked different, that I was obviously no legs and people were going to stare. And they said, we want to use that. We want to show people what you can do in this world. So I had the opportunity to start speaking, but I first got the brilliant idea, and Tom Zupanzik, a wonderful man, and my mentor at the Colts said, hey, I'll get you into speaking. So he first brought me in front of a bunch of third graders. It's a very critical group in life, I'm not going to lie. I realized this day, I don't have to do anything. I still speak to third graders because I love that class. I love their enthusiasm. I love how they see life. But I know if I walk into a room like this in third graders, there's always one young man, one young woman that will see me and get everyone's attention. I'll be like, all right, everybody sit down and be quiet. This is a robot here to talk to us. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. I am. <laughs> and I enjoy their passion. I love how they see the world. But more than that, I went out to different organizations. I went to different groups. And I got to speak more and more. And what I realized, looking about October 15th of 2006, almost 17 years ago, I looked at this world and thought it was over. And my time was done, but the enjoyment was surely gone. Because people didn't give up, because I had a good support system, because I had a love of a wonderful people and country. I'm here before you today to say thank you for what you do. I'm here before you today with my beautiful wife. We have four wonderful children. No, we have like three wonderful children. Yeah, but we have four children, but three are, yeah, three are wonderful. Well, I tell you to look at life in an amazing factor. My grandfather, before he passed away, after he retired, spoke at a lot of different organizations, a lot of groups, and I loved listening to him. But the one thing I always took away from him, he said this. It was in a prayer that was read at a lot of military funerals. He said, and the line that I took away from it was this. At this day's end, may this world be a better place because we have lived. And I take that very wholeheartedly every morning to wake up knowing that I want to make a difference. And sometimes my world is my wife and our four kids in that home. Sometimes it's the people I go and see at the grocery store as I go through and hold doors and saying please and thank you. Sometimes it's going out and meeting people like you and enjoying this conference. And thousands upon thousands of people, make your world a better place because we have lived. 
Give everything you have. Look at those times when you have to keep going up those mountains and down those mountains, the good times with the bad. But you never stop. You have those tough core things. You keep your head up. You take one step at a time, and you will change this world for better. The awards that are given out tonight, congratulations to all those. But to you guys, and IIT for what you do, and I didn't even touch on the insurance. Because how I look at it is the insurance that I had. And I figured it was those men. Those men that came and pulled me out of that wreckage. That tourniquet in my legs. That stopped the bleeding. When I was going through my worst possible situation, it could have been a lot worse. I could have not come home at all. It's the same when bad things happen. Those community members that you're helping. What you're doing is when something does bad happen, you're making sure it doesn't come home worse. You're making sure there's a policy in place. The one word that I love hearing and one saying is intently, to do things intently, to love intently, to be a good person intently. It means to go out with intent. So when you go out and talk to those clients, to be intentful with them of what they need, to go out and show them that, you know what, things change and to offer more things because each client is different, each experience is different, and to capitalize and to see what's better and see what works and have a different perspective and to love life, people see that and it'll change the way you see things. One of my favorite jobs I ever did was in college. Something I never told the Marine Corps that I did. I was in restaurant hotel management at Purdue University, so I got an internship. I got an internship at Walt Disney World. You don't tell the Marine Corps you worked at Walt Disney World. <laughs> they would use that against you somehow, I think. And I thought I was going to work at the finest restaurants, the finest hotels that they have down there. I didn't. I ended up driving a safari truck at Animal Kingdom for six months. <laughs> it was awesome, I'm not going to lie. I tell you that story because I did that job 23 23, 24 years ago. And that whole spiel we say, I don't know who's been on that silly ride, the whole spiel that we talk about, the animals and stuff like that, I still know it. So I apologize for what's about to happen. <laughs> Kira Booney, everyone, slide on over and make yourselves comfortable. My name is Joshua Wildlife Driver here in Harambe Wildlife Reserve. Jambo, Jambo means hello here in Swahili. So Jambo, everyone. Jambo. Nice. I just like making people do that. <laughs> I tell you that story for two reasons. One, because I still know it 24 years later. But back then what they taught me, if I do that job every single day for six months, I do that ride 100 times, it's ingrained in my head. Whoever gets on that truck that day, it may be their first time. Maybe their first time. So I can't just repeat the same thing. I can't have the same, I can't slowly back off of my enthusiasm. I can't change it and just put it on repeat, even if I'm going to know it 24 years later. It's the same in this business with you, the client. I'm sure you answer the same questions and the same things and the same forms over. It becomes repetitive. But I tell you what, it may be their first time. It may be their first time as a new kid coming out that now needs insurance on their own. That a person that maybe has lost their spouse that has to get a different type that's trying to protect their kids. Anything is possible in what you do. It's each and individual. But as long as you hold that spark in your heart and we still hold on to that 22-year-old kid, that ability in us to tackle the world, world will be tackled and this world would be a better place because this room has lived. 24 years ago, I also was doing that ride, safari truck, and that's where I met my wife who sits right there. I don't think she did the spiel as better, better than me, but I have the microphone so she can't really prove it at this point and I'll pay for it later. But I'm thankful for what you guys do. I love serving this country, but I love being here. Because what you do is when you find a passion, when you find something in your heart that will change the world but will better it, and you're good at it, ugh, the numbers go on and on and it snowballs and the fabulous things you can do. To have a smile on your face so when those hard times happen, you have those people prepared. When you meet here on a regular basis, when you come back and celebrate and to see how the industry is changing and change with it. When you find that next generation that you sometimes doubt, as I did, you realize that they may be your lifeline. And it may be the people that you're going to rely on to save everything. So treat everybody with respect. Find that passion in your heart, the love that makes you good and become better. And to wake up each morning with a smile on your face. Choose attitude to succeed, to love, but also enjoy the ride. Thank you guys for being here and God bless.